Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I am a board member with the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. This is Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. And my co-host is Elizabeth Castillo. Elizabeth, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Castillo at Arizona State University. I'm very nice of you to join us, and we look forward to a great conversation. Thank you. Great. So today, our guest is Sally Maitlis. She is a professor of organizational behavior and leadership at the Saeed Business School, University of Oxford. Her research examines how people make sense of important, challenging, and often painful issues at work and highlights the emotional side of organizational life. She has particular interest in the process of suffering, healing, and growth in the workplace, and is a founding member of the Compassion Lab, an international group of scholars who study compassion in organizations. Um, she's also very interested, uh, she's currently doing a study on senior organizational leaders who have experienced significant anxiety and depression while in their roles, and if you fit that description, she would absolutely like to talk to you about her study. Sally, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And thank you, Elizabeth, for inviting me and for, for hosting this, this event. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for turning up for it. Um, shall I take it away now? Absolutely. Tell okay. us, uh, give us the highlights of your work and what kind of things we can do to help people. Okay, great. What I'm going to talk about today um, is mainly around trauma and healing and also looking at um, growth as one of the things that can happen after people heal. Um, and I'm also happy to, in the questions, talk a little bit more about resilience, which I know some of you are interested in, but um, I'll, I'll save that for later, partly because it's, it's a very, um, compared to trauma, it's actually a field that is very, very much researched, um, you know, both in psychology and in management increasingly. Trauma, there's much less talk about. I mean, obviously there is in the therapeutic world, but there, there is very little talked about it in management organizations. So I'm going to focus on that, but then we'll, we'll sort of go where the questions take us. And uh, I don't intend to talk for, for more than about 15 minutes, and uh, it'll just be a brief zoom through, a summary through some ideas, and, uh, and then we'll open to questions. So let's have a go at the screen share business. How is that? Can you see that? Great. Um, right, I'll start with, uh, this is a definition of trauma. There are so many definitions of trauma that it's, it's, uh, it's not worth trying to get to the bottom of. But what I'll, what I'll say is I've chosen um, a very uh, general definition, a broad definition, which is simply the psychological response to an event or an experience that is deeply distressing or disturbing. And you can look at the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the sort of uh, Bible for mental health uh, practitioners, particularly in the US, and there's, there's this idea that it needs to be life-threatening. Uh, there are others who argue it needs to be a sort of assumption, your core assumptions must be shattered to be a trauma. And I think those are important definitions, but I'm going for a broader one because I think it's probably going to be of more interest to, 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 to us as a group today. So that's, that's what I mean um, by trauma. And I'm going to just highlight these different ways that we can um, think about traumas. Uh, just to give you examples of different dimensions on which traumas uh, that, that might happen around work uh, can, can vary. So uh, the first one here is it could be a, it could be a traumatic experience uh, that had happened to you in your personal life, but of course it has ramifications for work because you work. So if you had a, a, a terminal diagnosis or a cancer diagnosis, that isn't strictly speaking a work-based uh, trauma, but it's something you would bring into work. That's quite different from something like abusive supervision, sort of repeated uh, toxic management, which is happening to you in the workplace and is traumatizing you in the workplace. So that's one dimension. The second dimension here you see, I'm, I'm distinguishing between direct traumatic experiences. So you're in combat, something happens directly to you versus you are serving others who are traumatized. Yeah, you work with a traumatized population such as traumatized children or adults, or you work in an environment where uh, you are daily uh, encountering trauma 
and you can become traumatized through that experience. It's called vicarious or secondary trauma. Uh, the third dimension is a trauma can be acute, something like a terrorist attack, or it can be chronic, slow and creeping and insidious. So I'm working in a very toxic culture. And then trauma, of course, can happen uh, in the workplace uh, individually. You could be in an industrial accident and have an injury that changed your life. Or you could be part of some collective trauma, like a mass shooting in a school or in an organization, where many people are affected by the same trauma at once. And uh, this just as a lay out the territory, really. I'm going to sort of home in on this uh, individual or collective issue and go on to talk very briefly about um, how we can recognize and how we can um, heal individual trauma experiences and then how we can recognize and how we can uh, work towards healing organizational uh, trauma experiences. So this is um, a sort of rather overwhelming slide, but the idea of it is it is very overwhelming to have trauma. And uh, these are just some of uh, the symptoms that you might experience if you've had, as an individual, a traumatic experience. And they include um, things we sort of associate with, with PTSD, with post-traumatic stress disorder, like having flashbacks, um, having, uh, having insomnia and so on. Uh, but they also include uh, all sorts of other, other experiences, like just becoming emotionally overwhelmed, uh, having panic attacks, uh, experiencing terrible um, shame and self-hatred. So uh, the, the one thing to say about this is you, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to tick all these boxes to have had trauma. If you have a few of these or you know somebody who's displaying a number of these, then that's a case of trauma. Equally, I should say that you may not see somebody display these because they may have gone to a sort of numbing out, dissociated place with their experience and they've cut off from it. And these are people who appear to be absolutely completely handling life until something happens that triggers this kind of unprocessed wound and then some of these things start to show and it's very very shocking to that individual and to people working with them because actually at some level they felt they were okay and certainly other people did so just some some, some ways you might recognize it um, what what can you do in this situation as an individual or for an individual who uh, has experienced traumatic experience of any of the kinds that I've mentioned. And this slide describes in the first line that the, the healing process is a sort of classic three-phase healing process that the therapeutic literature talks about, which is first of all needing to create safety and stability for a person before they can begin to, to actually work with their trauma. Then the second phase of processing it, going through it, accessing it, processing it, talking about it. Um, and the final phase of integrating that experience and the understanding of that experience into their lives. And if we go down to the next tier of this slide, um, it, it's sort of showing you what that person primarily does at each of those um, phases of the, of the healing process. So in that first phase, um, if they're working with a therapist or if they're talking to somebody who they they trust that the important thing is to create some sort of safety and stability for them because after a trauma, people do not feel safe and they do not feel the world as what they thought it was. And so it's very hard to do anything at all until they, they have some sense of it's safe now. It's now it's safe. And, and in that place, the work that they are trying to do is to regulate their emotions. And by, by that, I mean bring their emotions to a sort of manageable level where they're not hyper aroused which is what happens in trauma, people's autonomic nervous systems go crazy, they become very, very activated. It's impossible to, to think or to function when you're, when you're at that high level of arousal. But equally other people, or those people at other times, may go into this numbing state, this hypo-arousal, where they can't feel anything and they're almost not there, they're almost not, 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 not present. So they need to get themselves into that sort of middle band, it's called a window of tolerance, into the window of tolerance where they can feel something but not be overwhelmed by the feeling. And then once they've achieved that, um, then, they, then they can do this work of making sense of what has happened. And this is what's happening in the processing stage. And then in the third, in the third stage of it, it's this, this integration of the sense they've made. How can they build this into an understanding of themselves and the world they live in without it just being impossibly bleak? 
And this is where we come to talk about healing versus growth. And, 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 and a growth story after trauma is somebody who's able eventually, and never quickly, never instead of the, the terrible feelings, but they're eventually able to construct very new, positive, hopeful meanings and, and understandings of themselves and their relationships and the future. So this is what the person needs to do. These are the phases they do it in. And then, of course, the question for many of you is, what, what can I do to help somebody who's in this, in this situation? And um, the research shows you can actually do a lot. I mean, family and friends can do a lot in terms of social support. Colleagues and managers and leaders in organizations can provide um, occupational support. And this is really just giving somebody the time, attending to the noticing that, they, that something might be up, giving them the space to tell you what they can, not to demand they tell you what they, what they don't um, feel able to, and to, to just make some um, leeway and allowance for what they aren't able to do at work yet, how they, how they may not be able to relate as they once did, but it's just okay. You're just giving them that, that space, and this is you trying to provide some safety and stability for them in the first instance. Um, all the research on, on compassion in organization shows that this is so crucial about, about noticing that somebody might be suffering, um, attending to them, giving them your, your attention, and then, and then trying to help alleviate their suffering uh, if they want it, and, 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 and in certain ways that, that feel acceptable to them. And there's of, often a lot of trust issues after somebody has experienced the trauma, so it's not, it's not as simple as it sounds, but these are things that you can do uh, to really make a difference. The last piece here is called attentive companionship. This is a term that I developed drawing on some of the post-traumatic growth literature, which writes about expert companionship, and it talks about the role the therapist plays is to listen very, very carefully and to notice when the the person suffering is beginning to make a different kind of sense, beginning to tell a different kind of story about themselves, not denying what's happened, but saying that even though this has happened, or even because this has happened, I found that I'm stronger, or I feel closer, I never realized people loved and cared for me so much. I never realized this organization could respond to me in the way it has done. And by attending to that, and just gently highlighting some of the things they're now beginning to see, this can be the path to, to growth for these individuals. And I call it attentive companionship because I don't think you need to be an expert. You don't need to be an expert clinician to provide this kind of uh, attention on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a work basis. So that's a very, very rapid rush through. We can come back to any of these points in the, in the, in the questions, but I want to just um, talk briefly about how do we know when an organization is in trauma? And there's wonderful work by Bill Kahn at Boston University, who's, who's really spent his life studying um, distress and trauma in organizations. And then also wonderful work by Vivian uh, and, and Horman, who are practitioners who have spent a lot of time helping organizations to heal. And drawing across that work, uh, what we can see is that organize, what's happening in organizations which have experienced the trauma, and that might be a one-off trauma, or it might be one of these, these um, persistent traumas, is that people avoid talking about the trauma. It becomes this kind of toxic zone that nobody wants to go near. And the people in the organization are feeling some, some all range of feelings, and maybe guilt, anxiety, burnout, exhaustion, all sorts of shame, you know, depending on their part in, in, in what has happened. But they don't share those feelings. Uh, no one's talking, people are feeling, they're not sharing the feelings, people become more isolated. People actually withdraw from the relationships which might have been helpful. And then they become uh, what Bill Kahn talks about as being dispassionate. Uh, and he's actually studied often the sort of human service organizations where the whole work of the organization is to be compassionate. And he finds that when there's this collective trauma happening, people pull away from each other, they distance themselves, they can't handle anybody else's suffering. So they, they sort of br brush it off and become uninterested and, 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 and uh, almost cruel because they're just, they've gone into their own state of trying to protect themselves. Uh, in certain organizational trauma situations, uh, we scapegoat certain individuals. It's so much easier to blame one person, one bad apple, than to say the whole system is, is traumatized. And so we try to point out who we, whose fault we think it is. And sometimes we get consultants in to remove that person. And what do you know, a few months later, it's back, even though the person is gone. So this is also something that happens. And then building from that, organizations end up inadvertently creating these unhealthy relational structures 
where they reorganize in these avoidant patterns and end up becoming a way of working which is actually even less healthy than, the, than they were before they reorganized. And then over time, people become hopeless and cynical and so on. So that, you know, if any of you have worked in a place like that, you're probably recognizing what I'm saying, but some of you um, may, may, may look back now and think, oh yes, that's, that's what may have been going on. So what can, what can we do for these sorts of organizations? And again, I'm drawing on this excellent work uh, by Vivian and, and Hulman, who um, talked about um, the importance of containment of these feelings. Uh, people are feeling all these things that nobody's containing. And the leader is often understood to be the, the sort of person in an organization who should be offering some kind of containment. This is very problematic if the leader is implicated in the organizational trauma. Um, but if the leader um, isn't and is able to take this position, it's almost like a parental position where you're, 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 you're the attachment figure for these people and you're, you're now providing a safe place to explore this, this problem. Otherwise, often consultants, outsiders come in or you may see yourself as somebody who's neutral enough to do this work. So you acknowledge and name the problem, you break this conspiracy of silence which has come over the organisation, you, you create a safe place where people can talk. And it's not about blaming, it's about just sharing what you're feeling and as you share that, the idea is to normalize people's experiences and say, well, no wonder you're feeling this way, you're behaving this way, in fact, because this is what happens in organizations that have gone through what you have gone through. And then having done that, having walked through those, those steps, you're then together working to try to make some kind of collective sense which can be healing. So um, Jennifer said, just, just find three things that they can take away with them. So, <laughs> okay, let me find you three things you can take away before we, we go into the questions. And these are my three things. I'm really just pulling across these two, these two strands of individual and collective trauma. And what are the key tasks that we need to do to, to uh, heal and grow from individual collective trauma? We need to surface these feelings. Sometimes they're shut very far away. We need to share them to the extent that it feels safe for the people to, to share and we need to create safety so they can do that. And then we need to work on regulating, helping people regulate their own emotions, it's such a, a core piece of, of uh, what people need to, to do to function healthily. And how can we do that in organisations? Well, we can do that with social support from friends, with occupational support coming from um, colleagues and, uh, and managers. We can show compassion by noticing what's going on for people, by attending to them, by empathizing with what they're, they're feeling as far as we're able, and by, by trying to alleviate the suffering they're experiencing. And we can do this through this attentive companionship that I mentioned before, very, very careful listening. Even if the person's having to tell their story or the organizational members are having to tell their story multiple times, we're listening, we're, we're, we're not with an agenda, we're not trying to get them to a place of growth, we're just listening and, and, and enabling their telling of it and their, their own working through of what they've been through so they can come to some new uh, understanding and then a new way of, of thinking about themselves and their organization. And all of this will be more possible if the organization has a supportive culture where people um, feel cared for and they feel that emotion is, uh, it's possible to express emotion in this place and it's possible for healing to take place, and that people can bring more of their whole selves into this organization because the organization is a holding environment which can support people and their, and their challenges. So that's where I'm going to stop for now, and uh, I'll stop sharing this. And well, hand it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sally. Um, that was really helpful and kind of emotional because as you're going through that, like that screen of what the trauma is, I'm sure I'm not alone, uh, that everybody was like, oh, I tick that one, tick that one, tick that one at a completely different time over here, <laughs> done pretty much the whole circle at some point. Um, and it, I think the, the, the comments about how do we create yeah, you know, the question becomes how do exactly do we create a culture where it's safe for people to share their traumas, um, especially if the organization is in, experiencing a collective trauma? Mm -hmm. Because you're right, I do think people kind of get this hard, well, I can handle it, and then that becomes the culture, and that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. um, 
So let me ask some of the questions uh, that we got at the beginning and then we'll open them up for um, you know everyone else. And by the way, if you have a question, please put it down in the chat. Um, but how, how do we start these conversations and how do we talk to someone about trauma? Well, it's a, it's a really, really important question. And I think it's, I think it's one of the many, many things in organizational life that is people often feel it's easier to just not talk about it at all in case they mess it up. And uh, I think people feel the same when someone's had a bereavement. You know, it's just too difficult to know what to say and to say it right, so I won't say it at all. And I would really um, recommend against that. Uh, at the same time, I do not suggest you go in uh, full, full bore and say to somebody, so what happened? And in fact, a lot of the current research on trauma is that it's not helpful for people to recount exactly what happened in detail. They can end up re-traumatizing themselves. So I would say how you talk about it is just by saying, how are you doing? I've been wondering how you're doing. I mean, it depends what you know. So maybe you know nothing, but you see somebody seems a bit off. And then it's a matter of saying, you know, how, how are you? And saying it in a way that really, really suggests, and I want to know if you want to tell me. And I think we don't do that enough. We're so used to just assuming that's not a real question. And so the, the kind of how are you really uh, can be in itself enough. If, uh, if you do know what someone has been through, uh, and it seems a bit artificial to, to, to sort of act as though you don't, you can say, I've been thinking about you. And I'm just wondering how you're doing. I'm wondering if you, you want to talk you know, about anything. And I, I would say just something as soft as that to open it and then let them, let them say as much or as little as they, as they want. So how do you help staff members that don't want to talk? um that you think really should talk or mm. or process i think that how do you help employees that need to process who are resistant to processing i think with great respect because when people are resistant to processing something traumatic you know, that's their defense that's how that's how they are looking after themselves right now and I think in a sense, it's only, it's only really your, your right or your duty as a, as a manager or as a colleague to, to get someone to do it. Um, if it's clear in work terms that something is, you know, something is, is not working. So they are seeming in a, in a bad way. It's your concern for them. Their work is going off. Um, but I think if somebody says, I don't want to talk about it, then you can say, yeah, I, I respect that. Maybe I'm not the right person, but I'd like to get you some help because it seems that you know, things are not, are not going well for you right now. And I think that's the thing. It's definitely not about sort of bludgeoning somebody into a conversation, which a part of them, uh, a part of them feels this isn't safe to talk about this now. And is that kind of how, why, how and why to use the compassion as an applied skill in the workplace. It seems to me that that's just approaching it from the lens of compassion, um, true compassion and not just, you know, uh, would be helpful. Can you speak to that at all? I mean, absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, you know, I can see Root is on this, this call, which is lovely to see Root. Um, you know, Root has studied compassion for, many, many years. Um, and yes, you, you almost, I think you can't go wrong. You know, you can't go wrong with compassion unless you come in with an agenda that you need to help fix this person. But as far as we understand compassion to be about noticing someone's suffering and, and attending to it and, and, and empathizing with them, that, 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 I mean, it can go amiss if somebody is really um, can't even bear that, that, that degree of attention. But um, it, Absolutely. Well, that kind of brings me to the next question. We got a lot of these in the sign up forms. Um, a lot of the questions were not about organizational trauma, but um, personal individual trauma. And the question is, how do we know if we should just push through and tough it out? 
or whether we need to process a traumatic experience? Mm. Uh, I mean, one good clue is if it's not going away. So if you're thinking about it, if you're dreaming about it, if you're not able to sleep because of it, or if uh, small things that when you, when you recount this, what happened to your spouse or to your friend or something, and the, the, the degree of your reaction kind of outweighs uh, the, the seeming prompt for it, that is a great clue that you have stuff which is bubbling away and has not been processed. Um, and that, that it needn't be a trauma, but, 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 but it often would be a sign of a trauma. Um, I think the other, the other thing I would say, maybe this speaks to your last point about compassion. Here I'm bringing the idea of self-compassion. And I think, you know, there's this sort of culture that still many of us are part of where, you know, the thing to do, the right thing to do is to tough it out and to suck it up and get on with it and don't be a wimp. Um, is, is like a critical voice in our heads that doesn't allow us to feel some of the things we're feeling, doesn't want us to feel them. And if you can bring to that a, a, a voice of, of compassion for yourself, and often, often people in self-compassion say the kind of voice you would use to a very good friend who was suffering, what would you say to that person? Would you say, you know, tough it up, tough it out, just get on with it, you know, just, it'll pass you know, probably you wouldn't. So if you wouldn't say it to them, maybe you shouldn't be saying it to you either. And just just consider having a, having a conversation about it. Um, the final question I have before we move to the questions in the discussion board, because there's a ton of really good questions coming up in the chat, is um, seeking, giving yourself permission to seek mental health care like what are the tools out there that people should not be afraid to resource if they feel they are having trouble processing mm. um there's i mean wonderfully there are so many you know there, there, there are so many um things that we can now just go on the internet and we, and we can find uh, and there's sort of cranky nonsense too but there, there, there's a lot of just really really good stuff and so um you know, if you think about just, just self-regulation, I mean, we know now that mindfulness or meditation, we know that this is an incredibly powerful way to, to regulate uh, your, your feelings and to, to just calm, calm yourself down. Uh, we know that connecting to somebody you trust and just spending time with them, even if you're not talking about the thing at all, just being around somebody, just not feeling alone, is enormously powerful, even if it's over Zoom, as so many of our, of our relationships have been in recent times. Um, there are, uh, you know, there's, there's endless things you can read about cognitive reframing, and you can actually go quite a long way, but, but I would say a part of the healing is often feeling able to do this for somebody who can you know, psychologically hold you and make it, make it feel safer to explore this stuff. And so you, you can go online and you can do a lot of stuff and you can do yoga. I mean, all, the, all of these things are good for you. You can go for a run, that's good for you. You can, you know, eat well. All of those things are going to be helpful in, uh, in, in, in healing. Um, but I, I, I think if you really feel you're in difficulty, I, I, I would recommend you see, you see a professional. Yeah, and I asked that because, you know, I did have a traumatic experience and it took me two years to get to the point where I went to professional and I just kicked myself for not having gone sooner because I suffered so much in those two years and the professional was able to help me within just a few months to contextualize it and, and develop coping mechanisms that allowed me to get back to kind of, um, I wouldn't say normal, <laughs> but functional in a way that I had not been for over two years. So, yeah, um, yeah I think that there's still, I mean, this is one of the reasons I'm studying uh, these mental health challenges and leaders, there's still so much stigma around mental health. And it's just crazy when you think that we all now accept physical health is important and we should, you know, go to the, and, and it's, it's just crazy to think that mental health is either less important or more something that we ought to be equipped to, to sort out ourselves. Um, why, why, why should it be? So I, I, I yeah, I agree. Right. 
So um, Elizabeth, um, I think we're ready to open up for the chat room and um, get some of the questions in the chat room asked and answered. Um, okay, great. I will start with a, a question from Claire Collins, um, who wants to know how to help people who are in the shock state of trauma. Um, if they don't even know what, what to feel, what they're feeling, and um, they also feel like they might be wrong by being in that state, um, what suggestions would you have? Mm. I mean, I would just sort of go straight to the, 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 the first phase of a trauma treatment, which is safety, safety and stabilize. So they're in shock. So they need to engage in some of these practices which help them to, to self-regulate and to, to not feel in a, in a state of shock. And that um, may just be really treating themselves with care. It may be doing lovely, soothing, self-compassionate things for themselves. It may just be talking to somebody they, they trust and not trying to figure it out. I think when you're in a state of shock, trying to get involved in making sense of what we do, we're sort of compulsive sense makers, but it's going to be very difficult to do that while you're still in that hyper aroused state. So just give yourself a break or help that person give themselves a break. And just know that this is, it feels like you're not doing anything, but it is the first stage of the trauma work. So the role, I just wanted to follow up on that, Elizabeth. So the mm -hmm. role of the manager is um, if they notice someone is in shock or not coping well, um, what are the steps that they should take? Do they address the person? Do they go to human resources and ask for assistance? You know, what would you recommend if someone's a manager and they notice you know, they're, one of their employees lost a child or something, you know, what are the steps that they should be taking to help that person? Uh, I mean, I would say quite a lot depends on the relationship they already have with that person. So in an ideal world, that person already has a good working relationship. They know this, they, they know what's happened. And then it would be going to the person and saying, I really, you know, I can't imagine what, what it must be like, what you're going through. How can I help? Is there anything I can do to support you? What would be helpful now? And they may then have to take that back to HR and sort of get the okay on it. But I think that's, that's ideally what you would do as a manager. If you don't know the person very well, um, then you, you, know, you may approach them a little bit more tentatively. Um, but I think uh, it probably depends also on your organization and your culture, but I think sort of going, going to HR would not, I would not say that's the first, the first port of call, yeah. Um, great, thank you. Um, David um, Greenway um, wanted to see if you could dive a little deeper into the attentive companionship piece of the model um, mm -hmm. and the role of the companion. He says, our tendency is to try to connect with them. I know how you feel, um, but this is often counterproductive. Um, yeah. so what language might we use and, and what and how should our approach be in that phase? Yeah, that's a great observation because you know when we're trying to be empathic and we say I know how you feel and so often that person feels no you have no idea how you feel especially if you say I know how you feel because this thing happened to me and first you know you've taken the, the conversation onto yourself and you're talking about something which is not what's happened to them so um, I mean great first step that you know that's not the thing to say. Um, what, 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 um, what I say with attentive companionship is you're really following the lead of the person suffering. And so you're listening, you're, you know, you're, you're almost your main role initially is just to listen without trying to get answers or offer answers or, or, or do anything like that. You're just listening them and enabling them to begin to build their, their understanding and their, and their story. And then if you notice them speaking with hope or you notice them developing a new understanding what's happened you might just hold that up you might just highlight that but I think um, you know I've been studying post-traumatic growth for about a decade now and the, 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 the challenging thing is that we would love everyone to grow you know we would love to help them grow but it's not a thing you can fast track and so the only way someone can grow is themselves through their own process and so your role as the attentive companion is listen with patients have empathy um, and then over time, just help them. Um, if they may have missed it. You know, they may have missed that in all the darkness, there was a, a glimmer of hope, but you heard it because you were listening really carefully. And you may just want to gently, you know, 
highlight it, amplify it, you know, shine a light on it, and, and not then assume that they're going to be fine now and it's all looking up, but just these moments. I think post-traumatic growth is made of these tiny slivers which we then begin to craft into a, into a new narrative. Um, so I, Jenny and Mike both ask a similar question, so I'm going to combine them. It, um, Jenny says, I'd love to know more about the process of sense making, both at the individual and the group level, because it does sound central to the healing process. Um, and Mike wants to know, how does that sense making contribute to the dealing with the trauma? Hmm. Well, um, you know, sense making can go in lots of different directions. So, so sense making is about something unexpected happens it prompts us to to sort of ask the question you know what what now what's going on how do i understand it what does this mean for me what should i do all those questions and um sense making that is not productive is often sort of self or other blaming or, or sort of tie into an old story about these things happen to me because i deserve them you know th these are are, are that is sense making, but it's not sense making towards healing and growth. And so, sense making towards healing and growth is really um, trying to often to to externalize something that's happened and say this isn't this isn't something about me. This is something that has happened and it's happened to me and it's affecting me and this is how it's affecting me. But I need to understand it also as as, as separate from me. And it's about uh, not just thinking. We often think about sense making as being a cognitive process, but it's actually a very active process. It's about trying something and noticing what happens then. And through taking some action, you develop a new understanding of yourself. And so, actually, part of sense making, not early in the trauma healing process, but a bit later, would be experimenting with something that may feel daunting or may feel a little counterintuitive, but you you decide to try it out as a way of understanding how are you doing, what are you up for, what's possible, what else, you know, what good might be out there in the world. So um, a lot of the research on um, coping and on other, uh, other kinds of, of, of growth talk about benefit finding. You know, so it's finding the, the silver lining. And of course that is part of the sense making, but I'm very cautious about it because I think when we're in that terribly bleak place, the kind of, well, let's look on the bright side and let's be positive, you know, it's, 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 it can be very artificial. And if somebody else is trying to help you do it, it feels even, uh, even, even worse. So it's about um, creating conditions where you naturally do see things that are more hopeful. And, and some of the research on, um, on gratitude, which is now sort of so abundant, but some of the research on gratitude about just noticing good things in your life, just noticing good interactions you had with people are actually a way of sort of giving yourself more sense-making cues that allow you to begin making a more positive story. So that's, you know, it is a complicated process. That's a sort of brief, <laughs> brief dip into it. Um, and uh, another question that came in was about um, how to help staff members who just clam up and refuse to talk about how they may be feeling. Um, despite, you know, the efforts to try to encourage them to talk. Do you have strategies for that? I mean, again, it's back to, I think, mean, it's a little similar to the question that Jennifer asked about, you know, if people sort of just don't want to, don't want to. Um, so I think that, that may say something certainly about those people. It may say something about your relationship to them and the culture that they're in. So obviously there's a whole lot of people who feel it's, not right and it's dangerous to talk about feelings and people who don't think you should talk about feelings at work because that's not professional um, and those are individual differences but the main way we can sort of address them is by creating environments where it really is okay to do that in fact it's really um, appreciated if you do that and so i'd say although this isn't a sort of quick fix building that kind of culture into your team into your meetings into your departments where where people are in general more forthcoming and they share more of themselves, then people are going to find it easier to talk. But it may be that somebody really feels, if I take the lid off some of the stuff I'm feeling, I'm never going to get it back in the can. And, and actually, they might be right. I mean, they, they might be right, and they shouldn't sit there with a manager or with a colleague and do that. But then they should be, I mean, this would be a time to get onto HR, get onto an employee assistance program, and, and, and let that person see somebody that they can just 
throw it all out with without worrying about the consequences. Um, yeah, Claire had made a point, uh, building on uh, forcing someone to receive help when they're not ready can be as traumatizing as the original event. Yes. yes. Um, and then Brennan asked, um, do you have any advice for facilitating conversations about collective trauma experiences, um, say like natural disasters or social crises in an organization? I think some of the some of the, the, the things on the slides that I, I have shown before about just trying to create this environment where it's safe to express what you've been through and people can share those experiences and people can talk about how it affected them. That's what we have found is often most helpful for people dealing with any kind of um, I mean it's actually this sounds terrible, but it actually can be very helpful to be part of a collective crisis. Because although you don't all have the same experience, you have all encountered this, this same prompt. And one of the hardest things about trauma is how isolating it can be, especially if you then don't talk about it. So to be part of something which is awful, but you have all been party to it, I mean, you, are, you are resources for each other. And, and some of Bill Kahn's work you know, in these organizations where people turned away from each other because they were so traumatized and distressed, it's heartbreaking because they, they were resources for each other potentially, but they couldn't be that for each other. And so then the organization splits into these pieces and it's actually a harder environment to be in. So just the, the power of other people, it's, it's immense. So, um, Asaka had a question about how can managers insulate themselves from becoming too emotionally attached um, to the trauma of their employees? So how to create boundaries, I guess, so you don't get sucked up into the... Yeah, I mean, that's, you've answered the, you've answered the, 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 the question with, with the, I mean, boundaries is the key thing. It's the key thing. Um, and it's probably, you know, as true of trauma as of any other issue in dealing with, um, you know, an employee, but you need to be there for them while maintaining the, the appropriate um, distance. And I, I would say um, this is where, again, if you have as a resource in or out of your organization professional help, I think to, to, to draw a line between how can I be here for you as a manager and what do you really need, what would be best for you to process this, and it would not be me as your manager, it would be somebody who is trained in this kind of work. Um, Rita asks a question, um, if unprocessed collective trauma becomes so embedded in organizational culture that is it, it is inherited by employees that arrive after the fact, um, can the healing process happen in the same way? And, and I would extend that even to societies, right, is the collective trauma that we're dealing with now from past wrongs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... I think I think actually there is more hope. It, it depends, you know, who, who what who the outsider is and what level they are and so on. But um, you know, actually coming in, you can be sucked into it or you can be part of helping open it up. But that's much harder to do if you're very junior than if you're coming in at a senior level. If you're coming to senior level, it's a wonderful opportunity because you can also have, you know, you're noticing something that people in that organisation may not. They're so used to it. It's just how things are around here. You come in and you're offering this different lens and you're offering the, the opportunity to, to, to work with it. I mean, it's quite a thing to take on, but it would be fitting if you're senior. If, if you're coming in, you know, at a more junior level, that's, that's tough. I mean, you can try as an individual to do things differently. You can try and behave counterculturally in your relationships, you know, with the people that you're, you're, you're connected to. But yeah, it will be slow to change the organization. And Susan has a great question. Um, can, you, can I ask a follow-up to that? Um, and it has to do with police forces and police officers. They obviously have a tremendous amount of trauma. Uh, and I, I would guess that their coping mechanisms within the organizations are not necessarily the healthiest in terms of um, the need to be what they would call stoic in the face of these traumas. Um, and what you were just talking about is the the inherited nature of some of these traumas. 
Do you have any advice for that or do you not want to touch on that at all? Um, I mean, it's a cultural issue, isn't it? I mean, it's a cultural issue and then it's a matter of having processes in the organisation which are not conducive. And, and, you know, the advice is they should be overhauled and, and, and there's a, you know, there's a, um, there's a, a trauma-informed organisations is a lens that many organisations have brought to their cultures and they are grounded in you know, certain values of inherently, you know, we're, hit, we're trying to make this safe, we're going to um, have, be collaborative, we're going to empower people, we're going to give people choice. This is how we're going to be in this organization. Now, you know, I don't know how that would work in a, in a, in a, in a police force, but the idea is if you really want to do this and you've got a kind of culture which is completely goes against all those values, it needs a serious overhaul. Um, thank you. Uh, Susan said, um, if you as a leader of the organization also experienced the trauma, um, do you need to bring in outside help to process and deal with the trauma? If you can, I mean, it would be better. Because in a way, you want, you want to be part of that conversation, not really as a leader. You want to be able to share all your stuff too without having to hold everybody else's, which is it's, it's really very hard to do both of those. Um, and Alango has an interesting question. Um, as, a, as a manager of a unit, um, how do you deal with a situation where the personal trauma of one member is negatively impacting his or her performance to the point that it's becoming a cause of distress and almost collective trauma for the rest of the unit? Well, I mean, you, you talk to that person. You, know, you talk to that person, and that's one, one of the pieces that you may convey. I mean, it depends where they are in their process, but it seems like this is the perfect example of, you know, we'd like to help you and we'd like to help you for your well-being and for the well-being of the whole department. And, and this is what we think would be helpful for you. Are you willing to do that? Do you address anything that their behaviors may be having these negative traumatizing impact on the other members? Or do you just try to focus on, you know, helping them? I mean, again, it's, I think it depends. It sounds like it's something that's been going on for a while. So I think at this point, um, and you, you know, you could do a two-step approach, couldn't you? You could offer to help them. And when they say, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm actually doing fine. I just need to be left alone. You could say, well, actually, you know, it's not. It's not fine. You maybe feel you're doing better, but it is actually spilling out onto other people. Uh, so I, I think that would be very legitimate. You do it with compassion. You do it with care. Um, but it really is about, saving them and then saving your whole group. Mm -hmm. um, David asks a, uh, an interesting Real quick, uh, to everyone who wants a certificate of completion, this program has been approved by, by both HRCI and SHRM, and my company, Humanist Learning Systems, can offer a general certificate as well. So if you would like to get a certificate of completion for the program, uh, in the chat room, we need your, your name, your email and which certificates, plural, you want. You can have one, two, or three of them, HRCI, SHRM, or General, um, and just put that in the, the chat room. Continue, Elizabeth. Okay, um, David asked an interesting question about, has your exploration of trauma touched on Quaker clearness committees or circles of trust as a model for healing of, and a loss and grief? Uh, certainly not the first one. I'm wondering about the circles of trust. I don't know if that's, um, this is the problem here, <laughs> David can't clarify what, what a circle of trust is, but I, certainly not, I, not knowingly, I have not knowingly uh, encountered them. So. David, if you have any references on that, maybe you could type that in the chat box. That sounds like something interesting to check out. Um, for us. Um, and then Jinching Lu talks about how do you how to take trauma, especially you have been betrayed um, when you expressed your trauma to your boss. Um, and betray means whatever you have told your boss has then been shared with other people, for example. Mm. Uh, so that's very difficult because trauma, individual trauma often can involve betrayal in the first place. And then if in sharing it, that happens again, that's really, you know, building on, 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 on the wound. Um, so, I mean, it's, again, this is a rather hard one to answer in the abstract because it sort of feel, it depends what your relationship is like with your boss, what you feel able to say, um, 
why you think they did it. Uh, so I, I sort of have a lot of empathy and I think it, it's understandable that it would make things much, much harder. But the other thing is that you may be very sensitive to something that actually somebody is doing in the spirit of trying to help you but it may may not be feeling that way because it's building on your other trauma on the other hand you know it may have been an absolute violation of trust in which case you know i would have that conversation but then it depends how confident you feel to have that conversation so i yeah it's a difficult one um and lee asked a really interesting question um, in a virtual setting like now uh, i can imagine teammates have less person-to-person -person interactions um, do you have advice how to help employees and peers deal with trauma in a virtual setting? i think it's a version of of everything we've been saying for the last few months about just stay connected and find ways of, of making connection that feel comfortable to you and for some people it's you know setting up these zoom coffee mornings and so on and for other people it's just having an open chat on all day so they don't feel like they're on their own working from home um but it's it, it, i think it boils down to connection is going to be valuable to you and it needs to be connection in the way that, that works and sort of experiment with different you know, different kinds of connection so um and then uh, Anlia has, do you have any recommendations for resources or training that managers use to become better with their own trauma and helping others? I think there is a fair amount. I mean, it depends exactly what, what it is that you're, what you're looking for. I mean, I'm happy if you want to write to me, send me an email. Um, I'm happy to, to share with you what I, what I know about. Um, uh, yeah, not off the top of my head, not a, not a specific thing, but I think there's, there's definitely stuff around. Okay, oh, great. Uh, so people can email, or do you have a website on, on your thing that has references and resources? Um, no, not really being a typical academic. I have a bunch of publications, but not, um, not useful things for people, so <laughs> just send me an email. Okay. Um, I think that's all that's in the chat box I see for now, Jim. Do you have any other questions you'd like to follow up with? You're muted, Jim. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, let me look at the questions. Okay, so <sighs> one of the questions I thought was really interesting and the, the, the questions that were asked during the, the registration was, we often think about resilience as an individual or interpersonal process, but how can we build organizational cap capacity to cultivate collective resilience within our organizations and communities? Mm. So that is a really massive, massive question. <laughs> um, and I don't know, if, uh, let me, if I can just do this screen, I think I do, I, I have a couple of slides looking at resilience. Let me just, um, See if I can quickly find them. Um, and I will take this as a reminder to, um, if you want a certificate or multiple certificates, I need your name, your email, and which certificates you want, SHRM, HRCI, and or a general certificate. You can get more than one, it's fine. Um, and just you know, put it in the chat box. And if you have any questions, we still have about five minutes. So you're welcome to ask them there as well. Okay, so um, I'll just I'll just flash through a few a few points here. So, uh, so this is this is really a, a sort of picture of how um, organizations can build resilience in their individuals. And I think this is crucial because in general, not in every, but in general, you're going to be a more resilient organization if you have more resilient people working there. And this is just building on very classic psychological research and some of the work by Kathy Sutcliffe and Tim Bogus saying uh, resilience uh, in individuals really boils down to sort of having certain resources, being able to access certain resources in yourself, and then having experiences of mastery where you feel like you can do it. And so if we apply that idea in the, in the, uh, in the workplace, it's about giving people uh, the experiences to gain those resources in terms of knowledge and training and, and good relationships and then putting them in jobs and in roles where they can experience success and perhaps coaching them to do that. So this is a, a sort of image of how as organizations can we build uh, individual resilience. 
and then um, I'll come back to this. This is then trying to go up to as an organization at the organizational level, and this is drawing on um, work from, from Blue Check and Right, so who talk about resilience as a, a three-stage process and saying really a resilient organization is one that can anticipate, in some sense can, can, can sort of imagine the unexpected uh, and prepare for it, can, can cope with it when it happens and can then learn from it so it becomes more resilient going forward. And uh, you know, I can make these references available, I don't want to take up our, our last bit of time just going through this, but it's, it's really about at each of these stages trying to um, prepare yourself and work with what you have and use bricolage and improvisation to refashion stuff that has already worked in other forms, but in a crisis you have access to it, but not in that form. So this is, this is one way of thinking about it. And the other way, um, again, I, I, I always come back to these wonderful values and processes from, um, from Mike and Sutcliffe and more recently here from, from Bogus and Sutcliffe about these are the values. They studied high reliability organizations, but this doesn't just apply to high reliability organizations. If you, if you engage in these kinds of processes, like you question assumptions, receive wisdom, you make sure that you're always um, trying to learn from your errors, you're always trying to involve people who are closest to the, the source of the problem in trying to solve it, you're, you're building resilience right through your, right through your systems. But um, it's, it's just a massive, massive field, um, and it's hard to give a simple answer to that. Thank you, um, and we'll make the slides available afterwards. Um, is, and is it okay, um, Sally, that if I put your email in the chat box so that people can follow up with you if, if they want? Sure, yeah, okay. yeah, both if you, if you want to, if you have a specific question you think I can answer um, or resource, or if you might be, if you're a senior leader and you might be interested in being part of my study, which is, involves a confidential interview with me about your experience. And we're also, we have a request for the slides. So if you could send me a PDF of those um, afterwards, sure. that would be great. Yeah. Um, we have a couple minutes left. Um, Sally, I'd like to give you the opportunity to provide any closing thoughts given the conversation we've had. Any words of wisdom you'd like to leave us with? Um, I'm just, I'm so delighted that so many people um, are, interested in, in learning more about this area and I, and I think it's something that obviously many of us have personal experience of it but we also have experience in our organizations of wanting to to help others whether it's from a leadership position or from from a lateral position and um you know just just thank you for for coming and for your questions and your your engagement in it it's such an important topic and you know thank you thank you so much sally um, so this has been the Humanist Management Lunch and Learn for um, June. We've had Sally talking to us about trauma and resilience in the workplace. Our next Lunch and Learn is in August with Anka, and I forget the topic, but we're going to start again in August. Um, we have, I'm like, my brain just, we have Dean Carter in, in December, I think. We have Anka in August. Um, and we have someone from Denmark with the Build and Rose uh, process in September, and we're still working on October. So we hope you come back and always check our website because we have several events happening pretty much every month.